السلام عليكم انا الدكتوره ريت
three, two. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Karim Mahmoud, Department Head of Polymer Laboratories and Research at CD Creative Petrochemical Company and Research Assistant at Mile University. I would like to thank you, all professors, doctors, colleagues, and audience, to joining us our sessions. Today, we're going to talk about the influence of the national and global climate education, the innovations and research on the governmental politics and participation in the green economy. Here, we have some most informable, formidable intellectual stars in education fields, which are concerned in sustainable development, environmental, and climate education. Via Zoom, we have Dr. Professor Sharif Hassin Andil, Professor of Sustainable and Material Science at Alexandria University, Egypt. Professor M Malina, Dr. Professor Melina Austin, Professor of Oceans and, Sust and Society at Marine, uh, in, at Marine uh, in, uh, in Institute and Schools of Biological and Marine Science, University of Plymouth, United, uh, United Kingdom. Director of, uh, uh, director, uh, director of Center for, uh, uh, for Systems Thinking, Oceans, Land, and Society. Program Director and uh, Principal Investigator for GCCRF Blue Communities. Director of Center for Doctoral Training for Sustainable Management for Marine Resources. Also, Dr. Ahmed Shazli the director of, uh, of sponsored programs and centers at, at Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development, Egypt. Also, associated professor for marine, for marine uh, geology and, Oceano, uh, and uh, oceanography department at Alexandria University. Dr. Irene Sami Fahim, director of Smart Engineering Systems Research Center at Nile University, associated professor of industrial engineering at Nile University. Today, our session will focus on the inevitable of engagement, the climate, environmental, and sustainable development education as obligatory content or syllabus courses for all education levels from elementary, middle, high schools, and undergraduate levels to bring up a well-educated generation with a strong awareness and knowledge of the climate change and, in, and environmental issues. Generally, to make an extensive e uh, change in the human behavior, we should start with the education. The education will build to a well education children and young people, then to new societies. These societies can achieve the climate adaptation and a climate mitigation through the people's responsibility and recent response toward a net zero emission. Therefore, this new generation will innovate a climate solutions and actions for environmental preservation. Also, the role of the governmental and the private sector to encourage the researchers and youth initiatives and a green startup to shift toward the green economy. So, Let's begin, with, let's begin with the Professor Sharif Andil via Zoom to ask him, how can the education systems and teachers inspire the young people's researchers Private and scientists, scientists to, encourage to innovate solutions yeah. for a climate change and a green startup to shift toward the green economy? So, so with you, Dr. Let's, begin with, let's begin with the Professor Sharif Andil via Zoom to ask him, how teachers inspire the young people's researchers Private and scientists, scientists to, encourage to innovate solutions for a climate change and a green <coughs> startup to shift toward the green economy. So, so sure. you, let's, begin with, uh, let's begin with uh, Professor Sharif Andil via Zoom to ask him how teachers inspire the young people's researchers Private and scientists to, to innovate Okay. Hello, Professor Shreve. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Um, the word with you. Is it okay? Can I, can I, yes. you know, sort of do my presentation now? Yes, yes. 
हेलो हेलो डॉक्टर प्रोफेसर वाज यस मेबी देयर इज अनदर टेक्निकल इश्यूज हम कैन यू हियर मी करीम आई एम प्रोफेसर यस आई एम विद यू ओके प्रोफेसर लेट्स बिगिन विद यू प्रोफेसर हाउ कैन द एजुकेशन सिस्टम्स एंड द टीचर्स इंस्पायर the young people researchers and scientists <coughs> to innovate solutions for a climate change okay let me let me start with the presentation actually which i prepared dr karim for this session and um, i'm i'm taking part of uh, a book i i published uh, the book is entitled brains and hearts Uh, face to face with the nobel laureates and in this book i met 20 nobel laureates and i recorded my interaction with them i chose one of them and uh, uh, the title of my talk is the teacher and the ozone hole so i chose one of them to uh, show how teachers and how education could inspire the young people and make them scientists who could change the world um this is uh, uh sherwood roland uh whom i met in the um uh jordanian uh, capital in one of the uh, conferences and we were uh, well hosted by king al hasan at the time uh, and over the dinner uh i asked professor roland uh was it the influence of your father the professor of mathematics who made you do the calculations of the ozone hole who inspired you to do that work his prompt answer was no it was my teacher i asked him how come he said my te- my teacher give me a very uh, uh, simple exercise he asked me to uh, measure the minimum uh, amount of water that comes every morning and the maximum amount of water over 10 days where he was on a holiday uh, to record the, the minimum temperature and the maximum temperature and he said he asked me to write a report about why this have changed and this he said this opened my heart and my mind to understand what is going in this universe later on uh, uh, professor ronald uh, 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 studied in chicago university and uh, uh, he has done work on the um um uh, climate um uh, chemistry uh, particularly you know sort of he was very much interested in um following the chlorofluorocarbons which is emitted from the freons from the uh, air conditions from the uh, foam plastics industry and particularly to see how the chlorine atoms interact with the ozone uh, 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 molecules and he uh, went on his research to find that this is affects actually the layer in the stratosphere and make uh, the ozone the three oxygen molecules attached together turn into the uh, normal uh oxygen and make a hole in the ozone layer and in that case the depletion of the ozone layer makes the ultraviolet come and affect our climate that uh, he he came with his uh, uh research at the time concluding that uh, uh, the uh, ozone layer will be depleted and uh we are going you know so to suffer uh through uh, this as the um uh, ultraviolet radiation will be able to come straight to our planet 
and change the climate of the planet and affect the um, life uh, differently uh, on this uh, uh, climate. Um, this uh, theory uh, at the beginning, you know, sort of were, um, had a lot of debate, a lot of discussion. Uh, the ozone hole, he uh, uh, wrote a big article in Nature and he submitted a 150 page report to the American Chemical Society and um, he explained in various occasions what is happening via the uh, uh, interaction with the uh, ozone layer. Um, of course, the people uh, the, in, in industry who uh, have big uh, uh, empires based uh, on the economy of the of the uh, um, um, freons and chlorofluorocarbons um, um, debated and uh, and um, uh, uh, that was a national issue and this issue you know sort of uh, went uh, uh, that uh, Professor Ronald you know sort of wrote, what is the point of making science and discovering things and not doing anything and waiting until the problem becomes very, very severe. And at the end, people realized the problem of the, uh, um, via uh, so many publications, so many scientists worked and um, uh, action, particularly in Montreal, went into uh, preventing the uh, and banning the chlorofluorocarbons and he was awarded with his colleagues uh, a Nobel uh, Prize for their uh, chemical in chemistry for their chemical uh, analysis in the uh, atmosphere uh, sciences and uh, afterwards he was you know sort of uh, um, received a lot of awards buildings you know so were named after after his name and uh, um, well uh, 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 scientists uh, Nobel laureates you know sort of wrote uh, banning the chlorofluorocarbons and a lot of a lot of research working now to follow the ozone hole and what could be done to uh, rectify and uh, and adjust the problem which was, you know, sort of happening through the uh, how to remedy the problem uh, affecting the ozone hole. Um, a few years ago, uh, uh, Professor Ronald uh, left, left us and uh, um, uh, he closed his eyes, you know, sort of forever. And I uh, remembered very much, you know, sort of his uh, uh, talk when we were talking over the dinner, uh, uh, when I asked him what influenced the calculation of the ozone layer, he said it was my teacher. The very early teaching which he has received when he was a young boy that, you know, sort of changed his life. My question is, shall the teacher get a part of the Nobel Prize as well? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for this inspiring story. And well, Professor Melody, let me ask you about how can we engage the climate education in uh, the every level of uh, education and how we can engage the students, all students, from different disciplines and fields to work together across the discipline to help in solving the problem of climate change. Look, look, Dr. Karim, what, what I what I believe that um, the the issue of living together is should be um, should be. Uh, 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 one of the values uh, that taught to the young children in the early in early in schools. Um, what happened 
in the uh, when in in Paris, when people you know sort of decided for the global uh, sustainable development goals, they were actually reinventing the wheel. The goals which they were talking about are simply the goals of uh, um, all all the values of the religions. When the uh, ancient Egyptian was talking about. Um, I I don't pollute the river. I I you know sort of taking care of the uh, other inhabitants. You know sort of living with me. Uh, well, what we should inspire is uh, teaching those values to the students, uh, mixed with the values of the uh, um, religions of the um, national national um, feelings and everything, it, it's all one package, which is we have to live together and take care of our planet and take care of our life. And this is should be implemented in the very early childhood education. This is what I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your in kind words. Uh, the word with you, <laughs> we are sorry, <laughs> Professor Melanie. And again, I hope to ask you from your long experience in education, uh, what are the most effective ways to engage the students from a different fields to work together across the discipline to help solve the world's climate change problem? The word with you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Karim, and thank you everybody for inviting me and for being here as well. Um, I think we have to slightly wind back as to why do we want to engage lots of disciplines. And we know that the problems of climate change are very complex. They're very interrelated with the same problems of biodiversity loss, which is to be addressed at the later COP15 this year as well. Uh, my focus is predominantly marine and coastal systems, though increasingly I'm looking at how they interact with land. But these are very complex issues. And if we want, they can't be solved from any single discipline which is why we need to think about engaging different people from different fields. Um, everybody uh, has a voice here, and some of those voices are very different. Some of their perspectives are very different. And we don't come to agreements and solutions in a place like this in COP27 unless we can understand those different perspectives. So to get those different perspectives, which I would call inter- and transdisciplinarity, we need to engage with different people and, and get them engaging at an early stage. So I think climate in education has to be quite holistic. It has to think about things from different disciplines or encourage people to. There will be some who do very deep dive, as, as Professor Sharif has talked about, in terms of going into the ozone hole and deep chemistry. But we also need people who can talk about that chemistry but also maybe engage with the public, with the communities, with governance, with health, and think about things from different perspectives. And I think we need to try and engage the students of today to be the holistic people, the transdisciplinary people of tomorrow, so that that becomes the norm, so they don't think about things just from their own perspective, but they also think about things from the perspective of others. Now to do that, and I do that quite a lot in the work that I do, I've found that you can't talk in the same way to people. Communication is, is really important. So if we talk mathematical scientific approaches to children, to students, who are actually very gifted in the arts or very gifted in people communication, then we're gonna switch them off. They don't wanna engage in climate science. Equally well, if we talk to people who are scientists, who want to talk numbers, who want to talk ecology and biology, if we show them pictures or try and get them to engage with storytelling or drama or photography, then they're not going to get engaged either. So we have to try and talk to people in the different ways and hook them in in the different ways that work to their perspectives of how they naturally feel about engaging with people. It's, it's communication. So I think we have to take different approaches, particularly at school level, so in a project called Blue Communities, we engaged with school children to think about their future and what climate change was gonna be for their future, for them on their islands, in, in, this was, in this case it was in the Philippines, in Palawan. 
And the school children heard about some of the issues, both from scientists, but also from social scientists and behavioral scientists. And they went away and created some murals about what they felt they wanted the environment to look like, what they wanted the future to be on their island. And they also created songs. That was a medium they were comfortable in. They were much more comfortable in that medium than in graphs and pictures and, and chemicals and uh, all of those things. So we have to talk to people and help people to think about climate science right from an early age in what other way they feel comfortable in. And I think that's really important. I think, I think that's where I was going to try and leave that. Thank you, Professor. Let's move to Dr. Ahmed. How are you? Uh, let's talk about the question. It's how the sustainable development goals, especially those are related to the climate education to be integrated in the universities for better climate change management. Um, thank you, Karim, for the invitation. And uh, I'm happy to be among these uh, distinguished panelists. And I am delivering my greetings to my professor or our professor at, at uh, Alexander University, Dr. Uh, Sharif Andil, uh, for his nice presentation and for um, the unusual approach, as usual, uh, to, uh, to deliver the message in an in a, um, interesting way. Secondly, it is uh, by, by chance, it is uh, the second panel here for me to have a panelist from marine background or <laughs> oceanographic background. So again, you will receive the, uh, the answers or our perspective from the bottom of the ocean, from the heart of the sea. Um, regarding your question about the integration of the sustainable development goals in the universities, I will uh, take from uh, Professor Austin, Austin um, talk and I will not speak about the children or uh, school universities, but uh, on the uh, uh, school, sorry, school um, pupils, uh, I'm speaking about the universities. Um, how to integrate SDGs, especially those are related to the climate change. Uh, actually, SDGs are all interconnected. They are all cross-cutting. Uh, so let's not uh, separate or distinguish between them. But it's important because some perspective are, are, are wrong when we, s when we s speak about the climate change uh, goal number 13 um, and we can have it as a standalone goal for the climate change it's not right for instance uh, SDG number 12 which is responsible consumption and production is of course is closely interlinked and related to the uh, climate change life below water as well when you speak about the plastic or it's about the climate change. So let's go back to the in integration of, sustainable of SDGs uh, for better climate change management. Uh, in my point of view, now we have to refer back to the main role of the universities. The main role of any universities is ca can be defined in three pillars, which are the education, the research, and the community service. Education by capacity building and uh, providing the, the students in the universities with uh, the needed knowledge, skills, and the uh, competences. And here I would like to share um, um, our experience at Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development. Uh, we have a concept which is community-based learning, or CBL, where each student at least spend two um, weeks from the semester in the field um, learning and, uh, uh, and um, transferring his knowledge and his skills that he already learning in the university to the community. Um, and for instance, you cannot convince um, uh, uh, the public that the uh, responsible consumption and production is important for, uh, to climate change management unless you um, do this by hand. You cannot say that uh, the um, um, increasing the sea uh, level rise um, is, uh, is a, 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 um, a consequence of the climate change. Um, and you have to speak with people, you have to go to the people, to have to, the, to, to, to touch the local communities and to compare what are they having now with, uh, with uh, that in the past. Now moving to the second pillar, which is the research. The research should be devoted in the universities 
for the helping of the climate change and um, uh, climate change uh, challenges, I mean, uh, and the community service. Community service is very important to raise the awareness of the public, link the academia to the community, uh, and um, supporting the startups. This is uh, uh, the green startups. Uh, uh, we have at Heliopolis University the Center for the Entrepreneurship for Social Impact, where we are hosting and helping the green startups, uh, starting from the ideation phase to the incubation, um, till access to finance, and uh, and um, and uh, until they are launching their small enterprises. Um, and this is our role in the, the, to to help the students to 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 learn and to implement as well their innovative solution and innovative ideas. Uh, for the research as well, we have to uh, find uh, the finance. When everyone here in the COP is speaking about the uh, finance for climate change uh, or climate finance. Cli climate finance can help as well in the education. Uh, for instance, we have a very important program uh, funded by the European Union, which is Erasmus Plus. Erasmus Plus is one of the important programs to the capacity building in the field of higher education. And I, I would share, I would like to share a success story um, um, from, Hel from, from Alexander University while I'm, I was working at Alexander University. And we established um, a master degree under the Erasmus Plus on the smart education and the climate change management. It was funded by the European Union Erasmus Plus in four of the Egyptian universities. Now we have at least, if, I, um, I'm, um, if I'm not wrong, at least 60 graduates from this master. They are already have knowledge, skills, and papers, practical papers based on the practical um, um, uh, research on the climate change management. I think by all of this, um, this is very important. Of course, it's important to have a course in each university or each program on the climate change. Okay, but the integration of the climate change in each of the co in each course, like Professor Sharif mentioned, course in chemistry should be linked to the climate change in a way, agriculture, engineering. Um, this is very, very, very important. And uh, finally, um, I'm, co I'm convinced that um, the innovative solutions and the education for the climate change challenges or management cannot be done by the regular and the conventional assessment method we have now in the universities. It's not, it doesn't make sense to teach. Um, if you want to have innovative solutions uh, from the course, from the students, don't give him questions and uh, write about the climate change. What are the consequences of climate change? No, give him um, the, the freedom, the ability to develop a model to do a research, to, um, to, to do a field work or something and assess him or her on that. Thank you, Karim. Thank you, Professor Gray. Hello. Thank you, Professor, for this inspiring ideas. So, Dr. Irene, uh, what is the importance of applying the uh, climate education systems in our education in Egypt and globally? Uh, thank you for inviting me, Karim, and I'm really happy to be among uh, such honorable professors. Uh, actually, the discussion is very interesting, and you've uh, gave us a lot of hope about solving this problem. Uh, actually, I appreciate that we are really concerned, and we find that we have a problem, and we can solve it through education. Um, so, actually, uh, as Dr. Ahmed gave us some examples from Heliopolis University and Alexandria University, we, we realized that at Nile University too, uh, and we're kind of trying to solve this problem through the latest technology and uh, the scientific approaches. So actually, all of us, we have no choice, but we have to solve this problem. Uh, so luckily now, uh, there are several pillars, as my previous colleagues mentioned, uh, related to capacity building, research, and uh, community service, of uh, so actually, education is an accelerator, and it's very important that we try to help our students. Um, basically, um, at Nile University, we try to do some um, related programs to STEM school students and inviting them to have some capacity building courses also. 
the thing is we, we try to classify the subject into main four uh, pillars that we think that they need the capacity building in. Uh, green buildings is one of these uh, things. Uh, also life below water, of course, and uh, life uh, related to ocean. Actually, I relate to both professors because I, I was involved in writing uh, a UNEP uh, a report uh, about uh, marine microplastics. Uh, so actually this is the heart of it and most of the microplastics have a severe, uh, a severe effect so we, we probably need to solve that. Uh, actually um, other uh, things that really worked at Nile University is we tried to do some competitions after we gave these students the capacity building uh, in collaboration with the British Council and uh, Nottingham University in the UK. Uh, so what we found out that when the students get to the real problem, they find really innovative solutions, which is very important. Uh, and of course, as Dr. Sharif mentioned about the, how we in should engage faculty to help us also solve this problem. And I think most of the faculty now are, now are aware and they, they are trying to solve the problem. Um, in some of the courses that we uh, give to our students at Nile University, we try to also uh, look at the future competencies about uh, these courses. So um, improving their green skills, improving their uh, idea about how to solve the problem, uh, trying to find out uh, creative solutions, this comes really in the classroom. So instead of giving capacity building uh, courses, we, I think it's, it's very interesting and we found a lot of successful examples when we tried to do this in a more sustainable way and uh, put some obligatory courses in the curricula for uh, our students uh, in the undergrad. And of course, the example of the Erasmus is very successful. Every, every university now is trying to uh, do a consortium at, uh, at and submit Erasmus proposals for um, having uh, master's uh, students. Oh, it's not us, okay. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, probably also uh, the knowledge of the SDGs as Dr. Ahmed mentioned and the awareness, it's not abstract knowledge. We have to relate it to practical experience and this really makes a difference when we try to um, do some research related to real uh, life problems. For example, corrosion inhibition, w we try uh, to um, like, do some learning and uh, open eye-openers for our students on how to create green corrosion inhibitions, for example, instead of the synthetic paints. Uh, other things is how to decrease the microplastics in a real uh, way. Um, also, uh, we have this aspect at Nile University which is related to entrepreneurial activities. So each course, we have around seven courses that are related to uh, sustainable development. Each course has a pillar uh, that comes to entrepreneurial uh, skills for the students and of course the climate finance. So actually most universities are trying to have a diploma in climate finance. So I think this awareness of young students and uh, university students, we're trying to do like a combination of both and this is the, the real achievement right now that we found out we have a problem and we're trying to solve it. Uh, so there are several challenges, of course, but um, teachers, as Dr. Sharif mentioned, and it was really inspiring, have a great role on that. They should try to engage more students. They should have more mentorship programs for themselves, actually, before training the students. Uh, and I, finally, we are all trying to improve the learning environment. Thank you, Karim. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. I hope to ask you, Professor Melanie, about the importance of a governmental role and the private sector role uh, to encourage the researchers and initiatives uh, of youth in your country, in the United Kingdom, about uh, encourage them in the way of the climate change uh, research initiatives and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karim. Um, yeah, we, we, our government does work quite closely with the research councils who fund the research. So often we have combined programs that are specifically around um, certain problems. They, yeah, they, they may be 
most of our research programs don't necessarily talk directly to climate, but climate is part of the everyday problem. I think you, know, you, you described it well as, as climate is, is involved in all of the things that we have to find solutions for. You know, every time we try and find a solution, climate is in there. Um, in, in the things I do, biodiversity loss is also in there. So climate and biodiversity loss are very closely connected. The programs that government does, so government maybe leans a little bit on, on the research councils who fund the research, and then the research councils and the government talk to each other, and I've been involved in some of the conversations that they broker about developing the research programs and the education programs that are needed for the people in the future. Um, in our master's courses at the University of Plymouth, we have a, a course that I'm very familiar with, which is marine conservation. And you might think that doesn't have much to do with climate science, but of course climate science is integral to how we protect and conserve and manage the marine environment. And that course is actually much bigger than marine conservation. It is about managing the environment, it is about doing the governance, and it also has a, a research project that always involves an external stakeholder, somebody who's not academic, who said, this is a problem that we want solved. And they might be an NGO, they might be a government body or a government agency. Um, they can also sometimes be industry. And the students spend three months doing something that is, is very focused on a real problem. And they have to bring the different perspectives that they've learned about during their, their master's course to that problem. We're taking that the next stage further in the Center for Doctoral Training that I lead for sustainable management of marine resources. And again, climate science isn't in the title, but it's in there. Climate is, is a part of anything we do with the marine environment, uh, including plastics. So we we are again trying to make that very interdisciplinary, joining two disciplines. We say that there have to be at least two disciplines and an external supervisor from the, from the non-academic world. And the non-academic person is the one that drives the problem that the student investigates. So I think that partially answers your question. Um, I'm just gonna give another example of a project or a program that I'm involved with, which is actually in Indonesia, which is around plastics. And it's a really nice, very, very holistic program, working very strongly in collaboration with the Indonesians. And it takes the point of how does plastic get into the environment? So we have very extensive models of how plastic leaks from the rivers, from the pollution systems, eventually into the sea. Then I, with my group, pick up and look at what are the impacts in the sea on the ecosystem services, on the economy, on society of plastic getting into the sea, and that's the persuasive argument to take action. Then we also have a set of people who are looking at that information and talking to communities um, and engaging with communities on what they find the problems are with the system. and How would they engage with doing plastic, recycling, using plastic more sustainably? And then finally, we have a, a design lab, a, um, a living lab that is working with communities and with designers to try and design better plastics for the future or better plastic products for the future that won't get leaked through the recycling or through the waste system, but will actually stay in, in a circular economy. And I think, you know, by bringing those different approaches, working with the community, working with government, working with education, then you start to solve some of those problems. I'm not sure if that's quite answering your question, but it, it's about as good as I can get. Uh, Dr. Karim, I have just a small comment about Melanie's uh, discussion. Uh, actually, I see that the government now, uh, of course, probably in Egypt and in the UK, they have these initiatives that encourage young uh, people to do some startups. Uh, and actually, uh, they try to do this bridging between the academic research and uh, doing it uh, in a real showcase and I, I have like around 60 startups uh, in Nile University that came out of an initiative from the central bank. So I think we, we, we've, we kind of see uh, an initiative from the government, at least in Egypt. And um, I think this is the start. So I, I see how my students are passionate about 
ha having this like small fund or seed fund to create, for example, uh, an app for waste management. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting and encouraging that you see what you teach in classroom is getting to a real startup after they graduate. Thank you. Thank you, Professor and Doctor. Finally, I would like to express my full uh, thankfulness uh, to professors, uh, Professor Dr. Sharif Anzil, Professor Melanie, Dr. Ahmed, and Dr. Irene, for these clear, informative, and inspiring ideas for the importance of education and climate education to solve the problem of a climate change. Also, I would like to thank you, our colleagues and audience, uh, for sharing and joining us our sessions. Uh, we have, I think, 10 minutes for questions. Okay. How would you go about engaging the public that's no longer engaged in formal education on climate education? How would you educate, say, the construction worker, the waiter that's not involved in these systems or these policies and don't see it every day? Um, before giving the, uh, the floor to Professor Austin, I would like to share an expe ex experience about this informal education. Uh, it, was in about, uh, it was about the, uh, it was a project entitled the Ocean Citizen Citizenship uh, so we can we can we have something like awareness and education for informal education uh, for the local people uh, on um, issues related to the climate uh, to the marine environment and we can have it the same like the climate uh, by developing um, 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 v site visits and to to make a, a, a school inside uh, schools and to develop um, um, a module on the internet that is accessible for everyone with in, in a very basic way, um, videos, uh, short uh, talks, uh, and you know, because they, when you have it visually, it's much more easier uh, for the education than uh, to have it written or something on an academic way. So this was very uh, important and we made a, a pre-assessment or a pre-course assessment and post-course assessment uh, and after three months, we have we have seen the the increase in the awareness about the climate, uh, the marine issues, marine education, issue, educational issues uh, in this area. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, I have a colleague who says that every day is a school day, and I think that's actually true for all of us who have open minds. The problem is a lot of people have closed their minds because they have other things that they worry about. Uh, so I, I think it is a good question and it's an important one. I think we can do it and again it comes, it, to me it speaks to those different disciplines that we need to engage. So in the project I talked about, Blue Communities, we actually had partner organizations, partner universities as well as NGOs whose role, as well as doing research, they had that community responsibility role that, that Ahmed talked about. And they actually went and engaged on a very, very regular basis with the people in the case study sites that we were looking at. Now those people, I have to admit, were not construction workers. They were people living very close to the environment in the coastal communities who were affected on a Daily, day, daily basis by climate change and by the issues that were being discussed. And we engaged with them through some of these approaches which I talked about of going and focus group discussions, and going and talking to them about what we thought was happening, hearing their views, listening to them, and listening to what they thought the problems were. And then helping them to maybe, and, and this is the creative thing I talked about, helping them to visualize some of those. We actually gave them training in making documentaries and said, go out and make a documentary on, on what you think is happening to you. Now this is, for some of these people, it was the first time anybody had listened to them and what they felt about climate science. So it was a way of engaging by listening. I can't actually see that that wouldn't work in 
if you were thinking about an urban environment or a construction worker or somebody who you might think is a long way away from climate change. People who are working on, on building sites, I mean, I'm going to use that example, are affected on a daily basis by climate change. It's hot, it's cold, it rains, it's miserable. Working in that environment with a changing atmosphere when it floods, uh, when it gets freezing cold, when it's really, really dry, must be miserable. But does anybody actually listen to them to hear their experience? Because once you start listening, then you can start communicating. And I think it is about communicating and better communication so that we hear what they say and we learn, but then at the same time, we can then communicate back and they can learn from us. But it's, it's a time-consuming process from, from a sort of academic point of view or from a research point of view. But I think it's really important if we are actually going to keep the public engaged in what is happening with climate and why climate change is so important to everybody, not just to the bubble of people that are here in COP27. Uh, actually, I have um, also, um, I think, a nice experience. Um, we at IEEE, I think you, the, um, the association, uh, the IEEE association, it has some uh, activities related to underprivileged people. Uh, so we went like um, every year to a certain uh, country, Uganda, Ghana, Nigeria, and then we go to the villages that they have no electricity. Uh, and as lead volunteers, we try to uh, let them understand the basic principles of uh, solar cells and how to install uh, solar panels and how to measure the electricity uh, that is needed for their small houses and stuff like that. So this actually is really interesting because they kind of do this similar in, in similar villages. So you, you just start the thing and then it evolves in every village. Uh, and um, we, we're trying to train the students to be volunteers in this association so that they could continue what we're trying to do. Okay. Just, just very briefly, in that research project, Blue Communities, um, the community in the Philippines who are very, very engaged with their local communities counted up how many people, how many discussion groups, how many events they'd had and how many people they thought they'd reached. And in a research program, they felt they'd reached 2,700 and something odd people to talk to them about the problems in their environment and to engage with them and tell them some of the solutions that we'd come to and some of the ideas that we as a research community had. We also had a lot of early career researchers who were part of this process. Um, and again, you know, in this program, we came out with 37 uh, peer-reviewed papers before the end of the project, of which over half were written by early career researcher scientists. And, you know, we paid really strong attention in that program to capacity building for early career researchers, to gender balance, to trying to keep everybody engaged with their communities, as well as with the people that they also needed to engage with, which were the national uh, and, and local sort of policy makers and governance. So it was a big effort, but it was worthwhile. Thank you. Okay, there is another question. Okay. Sure. Uh, thank you for this uh, fruitful discussion. And actually, I uh, found that the, all the climate efforts are uh, communicating between the triangle of uh, the uh, it, it actually the SDGs and the, the, the for the NGO and the government and the business and uh, we always forget the heart of this uh, triangle which is education. But here I found al almost the discussion are highlighting the relation between NGOs and government, and you now when you are uh, presenting the education, you forgot the industry. And uh, as I, I'm representing the industry, I encourage uh, the cooperation between the different universities in Egypt, and we can have some experience from uh, the 
what what happened in UK. So I I want to uh, to just highlight some examples for the cooperation between education and the industry because this is the lost link between academia and the industry. I, and and I think when this link is uh, built well in Egypt, I think we can uh, transfer to another place. So please. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, industry is, is vital, industry and business, um, and in our case, consultancies. So I guess the UK example is that there's a massive rush to build offshore renewable energy at the moment, offshore wind farms. And we, we try to work with industry where we can. Um, in my university, we've got a very strong uh, engineering department who are working very closely with industry to develop those things. I think the role of research and academia in uh, and educators is to try and not just, so from the edu engineering point of view, how do you deal with the engineering problems? From the environmental point of view, it's how do we look at the risks of deploying at scale massively a completely new infrastructure in an environment where it doesn't exist. So we work closely with, with the business and with the industry to try and help them see what those problems are, but also help them to avoid the risks of being refused permission to deploy that infrastructure because of the environmental damage that might occur and how can we mitigate and prevent that environmental damage or can we weigh off the change in the environment because I wouldn't always call it damage, I would call it a change in environment against the benefits of having um, renewable energy. So yes, we do work with industry. I mean, we work with offshore um, muscle culture, so offshore aquaculture, which is these days becoming very big business. So it's maybe not industry as you would call it, but we, we do work with, with those kind of industries as well. In the same way, trying to think about the risks of doing what they do and trying to help them do what they do better. But also, I think, the role of many of us in, in climate-related academia is to how can we enhance industry that goes out into the environment. This is slightly different from the industry, I think, that um, we talk about here in Egypt, but is, is, is if we have industry that interacts with the environment, how can we do it in a safer, more risk-free way that brings multiple benefits to the environment and to climate change simultaneously? So, for example, with offshore renewables, it might be that we deploy aquaculture in the same place as we have the offshore renewables, or we allow static fisheries, with, which are less damaging than trawl fisheries, and we try and encourage and work with them to, to create those situations. Those are some examples in my experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, all in all, I would like to thank you, all professors, all doctors, and audience for this precious uh, collaborations and joining us this session. Thank you so much.